2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to ask you to read. We're going to draw back, all the way back, all the way back, if you can remember when, to verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. We're going to read verses 5 through 10 together this morning. And I hope that that will give us a sense of what Paul has been doing through this passage. A brief, quick history here of where we've come from. Remember that Paul is dealing with false teachers in the church. He's dealing with what we might call rebel rousers, those that are rebellious to the truth and also uh, prevailing upon the church to teach false doctrine and to lead people away after themselves and away from the doctrine that Paul is teaching. So he's addressing all of that. And in that, that meant that there were people in the church that needed to... uh, ask the hard questions of whether they were in the faith or not, whether they were truly saved or not, and to be examining the doctrines of the Word of God, to examine whether they were actually fashioning themselves, as a song from the ladies this morning, fashioning themselves after Christ and growing. Now, before we read this passage, it's a question that I'll embark upon with, uh, with this thought, are you in your spiritual life growing? You know, I appreciate a Uh, Brother Tom, he asked me how I was doing spiritually in our fellowship time. I think it's a question that we should be asking ourselves, how are we doing? And I know that many times in the Christian experience, you can feel stagnant, you can feel a little bit lost in your journey, where you're going and what you're about. And um, Pastor Phil, unfortunately, has been the recipient of me uh, having too much time alone because when I went on uh, the trip to take the kids to camp, uh, I also then went on to uh, Montana, and that, that turned out to be about 28 hours of driving by myself, which fills your heads with a lot of thoughts. Uh, and what that's been doing for us is coming back to things that we both know are important, and that is why do we do what we do, and especially as we come into this New year of our school calendar year coming, by the way, if you, have you been to the stores? Uh, you've seen Halloween, uh, you've seen Halloween. I, I thought we should beat the curve. I don't know why we didn't do it. Um, but our ladies decorated, and I really appreciate this, but it's really out of season because I think you should have Christmas lights up just to beat everybody else. Uh, but as we embark upon what's in front of us, It's always right to be asking, what are we about and why are we doing what we're doing so that we're not just coasting through life without purpose and without direction. And one thing's for sure, if you don't aim at a target, you're sure never to hit a target. And I believe these passages are here so that we will continually come back by the nature of the Holy Spirit, by the nature of His Word, to orient ourselves in the growth that God would have for us. So you are in 2 Corinthians 13, and I want you to know that God does have your growth in mind. So let's read out loud together, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 10. For those that are visiting, if you've got a Bible app, we are using the King James if that helps you. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 10, would you read out loud with me? Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. No, I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong." And this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore, I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Last week, we ended on verse 8 and came to this position of knowing that each one of us needs to make a decision to stand on the truth. The week before, we looked at deciding as believers a a theme that we need to hear in our churches today is that we make sure that we make decisions to avoid evil in our lives and not to tolerate those things which would draw us away from God or be declared by God to be forbidden or outside of His will or plan for our lives. 
back of that, we looked for many weeks at examining ourselves that we are in the faith. So as we come to this passage this morning, we recognize that this passage is directed towards believers, the Corinthian believers, that they would examine, and we know this, that everybody in the church isn't necessarily saved because they've attended this service or have attended for some time. It's a good conversation for us to have. And if you've got questions, you should be having that conversation. What does it mean to be saved? To examine that you really are a child of God. And as it says, lest you be reprobates or holding a false profession or a vain or empty profession. So when we come now, though, to verse 9, this really is Paul's desire. Now, I need to take a moment as a way of introduction into verse 9, but I'll read it for us again. These things that Paul said made him glad things that should make any parent glad of a child. Now, we recognize that Paul is speaking spiritually, so he'd be a spiritual father to the Corinthian church. He would have been the one that started the church. He'd have been the one to see many of those people saved and come to Christ, invested in their lives so that they grow. And any parent wants to see their child grow, right? You want to see them be healthy, and you want to see them take steps towards growth. I have to admit and it didn't have reflection over this passage last night. Um, but I, I nightly do some kind of a ritual with, with my little people. We say goodnight to all of our kids, right? And, but when they're little, we have little different tr- traditions that we've said. My, my first two girls, I had the same tradition every night that I would say to them. I would say a little poem I made. Fairest princess, fairest princess of this night. A wish I pray with day's last light. May I, when this night is o'er, see thy smiling face once more. That's so sweet. And then we had a boy. <laughs> Little boy doth, that doth wiggle and squirm. Why do you always act like a worm? I don't know. I. That's extemporaneous era. I don't know. So <laughs> it doesn't work to say that same poem to the little boys, but I was hugging my little boy last night and he's, he's, he's the same. I, I don't know which one of the girls started the tradition with him, but he's got this same thing he says every night. It's hug, 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 squeeze, squeeze, love, love, whatever. He says the same thing, expects you to say it back to him. But I'm down there hugging him and I'm kissing him and I'm realizing as I do, I, I get down there and I'm, I, I hug and I kiss him and he freely kisses me and I recognize that's not going to stay that way. And I was thinking last night, I don't know when that's going to change, but it's usually before they're a teenager. <laughs> right, parents? And, and you know, I, I think it's great that you still hug and can kiss your son, but it's not the same as when they're seven. It's not the same. And it's bittersweet because all you parents that have little people, praise God for your little people. Amen? By the way, church, never lose sight of the fact that God blesses with children and children are a blessing of the Lord. And by the way, just as a side note, I want to tell tell you I encourage two things. If God blesses you with it, get married and have children. Amen? Amen? Amen. And I'm available this afternoon. But, but why? Because they really are a blessing. Somebody asked me one time, and I, I can't tell you, you know, I remember a young guy calling me. This is not the message. This is me. Okay, just getting there. But a young man asked me one time, he was in ministry, and he said, uh, Pastor Jeff, I was encouraged to talk to you. Um, so I got a question for you. Um, we're a young family, and I, I really just, I, I need to consider how many children we're having. I think they were on their fourth. I need to consider how many children we're having, and, and I just want to know, um, you've got eight. Um, should we stop? <laughs> I, I count it a privilege that they even asked me. Uh, I, I will tell you, a lot of what we do in life doesn't make any sense. 
when Nora and I got married, we, you know how you do when you get, when you're dating, then you get engaged, you're, you talk about these things, and I think we said, oh, we threw it out there, oh, four or five, and there you are with eight, and um, I would just say this, um, any child that comes into the world, once you have them, you can't imagine life without them, and yeah, they're a blessing, and yeah, they're a challenge, but they are worth having. But when you have them, and you're holding them, I'm watching this with my, my family right now, with the, the grandbabies, I'm watching my kids hold those kids, and I think, you better remember these days, because you don't have them long, and you want to be careful not to remember them as the grumpy, well, I'm just tired all the time. Well, yeah, you're tired, but remember the joy along the way, because God's design is that children grow. Now, that that truth is there spiritually. And I know that's a long illustration coming into this verse. But I'm giving it to you because I want you to know that God has your spiritual growth in mind. And it's just as normal and right as it is for a little child as they're growing to put themselves up against the wall and see the marker on the wall and wonder, am I where I was yesterday? Or a week later, have I changed it all? Or sometime in their life, it, it starts to really, really matter to them. And then you grow up and you realize it never really mattered at all. But you want them to grow. And it's the nature of how God's designed the human condition. But he's also designed us spiritually to grow. So Paul said we are glad and we rejoice over these things. And we're going to walk through them in a reflective way. And he says we are glad when we are weak. Now, there's a couple different angles of this phrase, but one of the angles of this phrase is my personal opinion. Now, I can't say this with great authority, so you have to take it lightly. But it comes from a parental experience, and I hope all you young people understand this about your parents and grandparents and your great-grandparents in this room. Every parent and every grandparent and great-grandparent wants their children to do better than them. Is that fair? Is that fair? If, if you love your kids, you really want them to do better than you. And really in every way. And really the number one thing that those who know the Lord target is you want your children to love God and walk with Him. Above all things, that's what you would want for your kids. But you want them to do better than you. You want them to have less scars than you. You want them to have less broken moments physically in their life. But you also want that for them emotionally. You don't want them to have the heartaches. You don't want them to have the trouble. But you also want that for them spiritually. And really that order is quite reversed in its importance. That they need to do well spiritually. So Paul, I think, is alluding in my opinion, a little bit to that. We are glad when we are weak and you are strong, but I also want you to know that there's a real, and by memory's sake of our study, both in 1 Corinthians and now 2 Corinthians, there's quite important passages where Paul would give the reason for his statement of being glad in his weakness. So, for a moment, let's look, look at 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. 2 Corinthians 11, and verse 23. Reading through verse 30. I'm going to read it for us. It's a little longer. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23, moving through verse 30. Paul is uh, dealing again with false teachers in this passage. And unfortunately, is having to recount what God has done through him, in him, and in the Corinthian church as a servant. Verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. You might remember some of this preaching and teaching in the past year. I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant in stripes, above measure in prisons, more frequent in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. 
and journeyings often, in perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, and weariness, and painfulness, and watchings often, in hunger, and thirst, and fastings often, in cold, and nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. There is a way which Paul could read, and we reflect over 2 Corinthians 13, verse 9, when he says, for we are glad when we are weak, that Paul can be glad because of what God is doing in his weakness. And let me say this for everyone here. One of the things that you learn in your Christian experience is something that you will never get away from. God has called you by faith to have a relationship with Jesus Christ by faith, then through that faith to live a life of relationship in faith, never ending. So what that means is there are young people in this room where you've already experienced where you have set out plans and God said, no. You set out your plan and God said, that's not what I have for you. Now, what happens when we have a dream and someone pops the bubble of our dream? The Bible said, says hope deferred. You know what it says? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So very often we get our hopes built, in, built up into this plan and this dream that we've got. And then God says, now wait a second. I've got you over here. And sometimes when we're going through life, now, you guys know what decision paralysis is? Decision paralysis is trying to decide whether you should buy the 30 out 6 or the 270. <laughs> to make it even more complicated, you buy the AR-15. And all God's people, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Welcome to Idaho. I'm sorry. It's a, yeah. Decision paralysis is when you've got so many things in front of you, you don't know where to go, right? Happens with shopping sometimes too, ladies, right? No? I don't know. I couldn't say. We know that it is a blessing when we can finally get to a place and we make a decision. And we have settled on the decision. And we finally have come to it all the labor and the birth pain of that decision. We make the decision and then we step out on the decision and God does not do what we expect. And this is the nature of a faith walk with God. God will have you in your weakness depending upon him for every decision and moment and day of your life because you can't even boast of tomorrow because you don't know what a day is going to bring forth. But God does. So all any of us can do is put our lives in the hand of God and reconcile who he is and be at peace or continue to be fraught with anxiety and panic and, and, and ulcers and all kinds of emotional havoc because we're trying to make ha life happen often like trying to ride a bull and make it go where you want it to go. And what you generally find is you can only ride a bull for so long before you're going to be on the ground or worse. But Paul says, in my weakness, I have joy because my experience has taught me differently than I thought. And this is the difference, that God actually magnifies his strength in my weakness. It's actually in those times where my weakness is magnified 
that I have learned to see the bigness of God, the miraculous nature of God's working. But it doesn't make us recoil from it any less. When we have things that come our way that we don't anticipate, things that come our way that we thought we had a plan, we thought we knew the way, we thought it was going to work this way, and God changes it, it's at times like that that you either crumble or grow. And on your own, you will crumble. But Paul can glory in his weakness because he's learned that that's where God's strength is magnified. You know the next chapter over, chapter 12, verses 5 through 10, we would be remiss not to reflect over it. It's where Paul asked for something to be taken away from him. You know this experientially in your life probably. Anybody got things in your life that you wish weren't so? Anybody prayed for something to be out of your life that God did not take away yet? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to begin in verse 5. It's a bit of a difficult spot to jump in, but 2 Corinthians 12 verse 5, of such and one will I glory out of myself, I will not glory, but in my infirmities. That's where I'm going to glory. Listen, that's where I'm going to embrace and take joy, and it is maturity and growth in Christ that learns this. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure. Let's read verse 7 through 10 out loud together. You've got it there. Reading verses 7 through 10 out loud together. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Can you say amen to that? Listen, there's nobody perfect in life. Nobody goes through life without trouble. Nobody goes through life without trial. But you either go through it alone or with the Lord, and you get to decide. But the Lord has invited you to come to him. So we look at verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 13, and he says, We rejoice over these things. We are glad over these things. And he starts with his own infirmity. We are glad when we are weak. But he turns it and he says, And ye are strong. So we're going to do a little bit of a study there on the strength that God has called you to. And understand that it is God's desire that you be strong. Now, there are so many passages, there's no doubt that I will have left off a passage that you think would be perfect for this area. But I will start by taking you to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And recognize once again that it is the natural path that God has for his children that they grow in strength. Now, here's what I'm telling everybody here. If you want to know God's will for your life, it is God's will that you grow in your strength. And of course, he is talking spiritually. He's talking about your walk with him. It is God's desire that every one of you, every, and myself included, grow in our walk with God. Now, why do I say that? Some have the false view that you, and I know what this is like. I, I've used this phrase uh, often in our conversations. Uh, and you know what it's like in your life sometimes. Maybe there's, there are people that you want to get to know. Maybe there are people that you want to 
uh, know personally and, and just be friends with them or maybe a group of people. And, and sometimes it's difficult and it feels like you're elbowing your way into the room. Have you ever experienced that? Where you felt like you really kind of had to elbow your way in. And some this morning have the false view of God that that's what you have to do in your relationship with him. That somehow God really isn't interested in your closeness. It's all up to you. Now, he does give you decisions to make, but I think it's important to know that he's the one knocking on your door. He's the one that is all the time giving an invitation to you because he is faithful when we are not in with that. And this is a whole nother message, a whole nother study, a whole worthy message that the goodness and nature of, of the God who we serve and the God of the Bible is he's always telling us come. He's bidding us come. And he is more for you coming than you are for coming to him. That's why I magnify this moment. But in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, we just read this one verse here where it says, let's read it out loud together, Galatians 5 verse 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The idea of standing fast there is the idea of not being moved. Now, we're in the nature of the Olympics uh, right now, and there are a lot of sports that are this way, but none so much as perhaps, um, I, I, my, because my mind goes there because of old history, I go to wrestling. Uh, but fencing is very much the same way. There are many sports that are this way, and that is you don't really want to give up an inch. You need to stand your ground. If you're going to be able to combat that which is coming at you, you need to have experience, you need to have practice at it, you need to know how the body works, how the sport works, but you've actually got to engage in the process. And you have to hold to where you're put. And I would just encourage each one of us that every believer needs to have some grit in this world. And I want to encourage you with this as well. That when you need grit, you will find the Holy Spirit already there. You will find him already there to empower and to comfort and to encourage. But I also want to remind you that God does not do that for you as a robot. He does that for you as a part of the process and decisions that you and I make. But you and I, as believers, need to be careful to understand that God wants us to have a strength so that we can stand fast in the Lord. Take your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Then we'll go to an, an Old Testament passage. 1 Corinthians 16 1 Corinthians 16, now, uh, I know that this is going to talk about the generic, I'm going to say the generic man, this is mankind, but I am going to make a side note here, and that is Christians, and especially you young men, every young man's eyes, every middle-aged man's eyes, every old man's eyes, there's never been a time that I know of where it was more important for you to be the man that God's called you to be. I can say the same for you ladies, that it's, it's really important that you be the lady that God has called you to be. In a world that's trying to change and blur those lines, you need to have a backbone. Now, this is not a gender issue in 1 Corinthians 16. It's a character issue. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, you have your Bible there? Let's read it out loud together. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, Quit you like men, be strong. Get it? You with me? It's what God wants for you. God wants you 
to be strong. So, I hope it's not a tired illustration because I don't think I've told you this story. I've told you some of it. Uh, Some of you recognize that I have a dead tooth in the center of my face. It's a beauty. It's been dying since I was 16. And uh, I have these Invisaligns in my mouth now that I, all this is for the purpose of taking care of this tooth that is hollowing out and going to, and I'm going to be, when I lose my tooth, I'm going to have to go back to Mississippi. (laughs) I'm either going to have to go to Mississippi or I'm going to have to go to northern Idaho as a, but how did that happen? It happened because uh, when I was 16, my wrestling coach, um, he, he, uh, it was over Christmas break and he said, uh, I called him and it snowed a foot in Indiana, it snowed a foot and it was a mile uh, to school. I didn't have a ride and I called my coach and I asked him, do I have to come in? And he said, if you want to be on the team, you'll be here. So I took off and literally was uphill both ways. Because it started, you go uphill, you went downhill by a cemetery, and then you went back up, and then you made it to the school. I, I walked that mile, bundled up, I got to practice, I was late, but I got there, and Richard Broyles was a state champion wrestler. And in my high school, they were known for wrestling, uh, so I had a state champion at 119, a state champion at 126, a state champion at 132, a state champion at 145. And in that day, my weight was 126. And what that meant is as you went forward in wrestling, and if you weren't varsity, what you became was meat to be offered to the sacrificial wrestling gods, as it were. And so I walked into wrestling practice, and in the first 30 seconds, um, Richard Broyles had taken me down. This was training for state championships. He had taken me down, and then he cross-faced me and, and knocked my tooth out. He didn't knock it out, knocked it loose. And so there I sat for the rest of the practice. Now, during that time, Richard Broyles, Chris Pierce, uh, Todd Mayer, these guys, I would go into practice, and they would beat the ever-living snot out of me every day, every day. And I remember as we were getting closer to the state championship, I was, I was then, I'd gotten to where I was a junior, and same thing, these guys were state champions, and I was behind them. And I remember in practice before the state championships, uh, I was wrestling with Chris Pierce, who was, was in my weight class. And I remember shooting on Chris, in on Chris, and I took him down, and I hit a move on him. Jace would know some of these moves. I hit what was called a Peterson roll, and I had, I had Chris on his back. And I remember thinking, I do not know what is wrong with Chris. Chris is not trying. And then Chris would get motivated again, and I would have my eyelids on the back of my head, and uh, my nose would be come, smelling out my ear. And, uh, but what I didn't know was happening is by being beaten up day after day by these guys, they were actually making me better. And there was nothing for it. I had to have the experience. I had to know what that felt like. I had to know what I do in that situation. And that took a lot of years to finally get to where I could compete with those guys And I never attained their levels, but that growth happened as a natural result of going through the battles. And this is exactly what God has called you to in your life. You're going to face battles. Don't be afraid. You're going to face hardship. Don't lose faith. Through the Holy Spirit's power, gird up the loins of your spirit in Christ Stand. Fight the fight. Live for Jesus. Love God. Do right. Avoid evil. Do that which is honest. Do that which is right. Grow in Christ. It matters because you are a child of God. Going through this life as a light and testimony of the risen Savior. 
and God will be there for you in the journey. But you have to make some decisions to fight, to stand, and to be strong. There was a time when my son, Jonathan, Joseph isn't quite, I don't, I don't quite do the same with him at this stage. Maybe I will. I don't know if I will or not. I'm getting to be too old for this, I guess. Uh, but Jonathan, when he was little, we would wrestle. And, you know, when they're real little, right, they, they'll come barreling at dad and, and, and dad's, you know what it's like, you'll let the, let the little guy knock you over and then he's on top of you. And, and then, then he flat out jumps in the air and, and, and does the, what's that called? The, what's that bomb in the water? Cannonball. Does a cannonball on your chest. And you don't really realize a four-year-old can hurt you, but you, they can. Uh, <laughs> but they grow. They grow. And what do they do? They start getting stronger. And Bible says the, young, the glory of a young man is his strength. The glory of an old man is to know how to get out of trouble quick, right? <laughs> and there comes a point sometime in the journey where you realize it's no longer healthy for my son and I to wrestle. Because <laughs> either he's going to beat me or I'm going to hurt him. And I don't want to have to explain that to mama. <laughs> but that's wisdom, that's right. But you want your children to be strong physically. You want them to grow. You want them to grow to that. But again, the lesson is spiritually. You guys recognize all you young people, the doctoral stewardship of the word of God is in your hands. Every one of us has a limited time on this planet. Nobody knows how much time that is. But one thing I know is all of us aren't going to be here forever. We hope the Lord will come back. All of us want to see the Lord come back before we die. But should we die, somebody's got to stand for the truth and be who Christ is on this planet. And God wants people who have the character of men in Christ to do so. And I'm going to say in that, that is applicationally true for you ladies as well, to be strong. This isn't gender identity. It's be strong in Christ. Proverbs 24.10 is that other wing of the need for you to be strong. And it is this. If you faint in the day of adversity, what's it say? If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Are you ready? Right here? Our message is done. So here's what we did. Page one. Page two. A little bit of page three. All we've gotten through is page one. Wisdom tells me I should not try to cover the rest of it. But I do think it's really important for you and I to know that God does not want us to live in a place of weakness. Now, are you ready? Everybody's with me? A surefire way to be weak is true both physically and and spiritually. And here's a surefire. Are you with me? And I'm telling you, this is why many Christians are weak today. A surefire way to be weak is to do nothing. God did not call you to be a spectator in spiritual warfare. He did not call you to be a spectator gliding through life. I'm telling you that many of us as Christians have lost our way and have lost the fire of the focus that God has called you to as his child. So this, I'm going to, unfortunately, because you're hearing me preach, you're going to get me. But when I got 
mono in February, and they told me that that can be a year to a year and a half to get over, nobody really tells you beyond that what to expect is that that could be some time. And I will tell you today, I still don't know what I'm dealing with, whether that's it or not, but I will tell you that since February, and if, if any of you want a quick history of what mono looks like, you walk through the planet and then your, somebody takes the, the bottom of your bucket of energy and it falls to the ground. And you feel like you need to go lay down and you feel like you need to be, I won't say 80 because I know people 80, you, you need to be 100 and lying in bed. Okay? But I also know this. I, I do know this bit of advice that they gave me when I got the diagnosis. You're going to need to do everything you can to be healthy. And that path does not mean sitting around every day doing nothing. It doesn't mean giving up. And it doesn't mean giving in. It means, and I, just, I, just, I really just want to encourage you with this. The Holy Spirit is the best advocate you've got. Every day he's going to draw you to strength. Every day. Every day he's going to give you the opportunity to live in fellowship with him in the power that he can provide and the power even when there is weakness there. But the reason so many are lethargic in their faith and peripheral and disconnected is we've lost our way. We've not practiced our walk with God. We've not focused on the importance of our relationship with him and accomplishing what he's called for our life. And we're going from one thing to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, but is it the right thing? This message is not meant to be you know, simply convicting to the life. It's meant to be encouraging to your life in the knowledge of the God who is for you and there for you to help you to strengthen you to be this. You know, when we are weak physically, there is wisdom to do this, and I would highly recommend it. I've done it, <clears throat> and I found the benefit of it. When we are weak physically and don't know what to do, we often go to a physical therapist. And I'm saying that this passage would call us to spiritual therapy. And that therapist is already in the room. And he's already given you all you need and he is there to help you and will help you and will never fail you. And he'll be with you all through this day. And when you go to bed tonight, he'll be with you. When you wake up in the morning, he'll be there. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is a great God who loves you more than you know and is there for you more than you know. And that God, we go to 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 9, and we read Paul's heart in the Lord here where he says, we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Now where we didn't get to and the message is done is the idea of perfection. And that's where we're going to go next week. I told you it was ambitious to get through two verses. But as we close this message, listen to me, please. As friends, whatever weakness you have, God is there. And wherever you are at spiritually, I hope that everybody here is on the pinnacle of the joy of the, of the peaks of the mountain. But some of you might be in the valley. And some of you might feel some degree of lostness and wonder and question and concern. I want you to know that God is strengthening you, God is growing you, and God will be faithful to you, and you can count on him, but God's end in this for you is for his glory that you be strong.